So I'm really honored to, to introduce Dr. Timothy Golden. Um, Dr. Golden holds PhD in philosophy and has more than 20 years experience as a lawyer. His areas of scholarly research include African-American philosophy and critical race theory. And he's currently editing or just finishing editing the book titled Racism and Resistance, Essays on Derrick Bell's Racial Realism. He's also published philosophical essays and teaches African-American philosophy and critical race theory at Walla Walla University in Washington State. Tim, thank you for, for, the, for doing this interview. Um, I guess just to start us off, can you tell us a little bit about the book, how it came about and what the sort of general aims were in putting it together? Thank you so much, Darren, for that warm introduction. And as glad as you are to have me here, I, you multiplied that by 10. That represents how glad I am to be here with you today. So thank you so much. The book was conceived about a decade ago in the wake of Derrick Bell's passing. He died in October of 2011. And shortly after that, I began to think very carefully about how one might pay tribute to such an interesting, fascinating and powerful life, uh, the life of a legal scholar and activist and public intellectual such as Bell was. And I began a conversation with one of my professors in graduate school, uh, Bill Lawson. Uh, Bill Lawson was one of the few philosophers who I knew at the time who was actively reading Bell as a philosopher. So I thought it was important to put Derek Bell in dialogue uh, with philosophy. And then um, I became familiar, I have since become familiar, of course, with the work of Tommy J. Curry and his uh, penetrating insights into Derek Bell. Of course, Curry has been also been reading Bell philosophically, and I thought it was very important uh, given uh, what I knew about what I knew about Derek Bell from Bill Lawson and what I continued to learn about Derek Bell from Tommy J. Curry to put together a volume of essays that would not only view him as a philosopher, but that would also view his work as a legal scholar. I, for one, have had a unique perspective on Derek Bell, I think, because I've, I have seen at times deep theological overtones in his work. I have also seen uh, religious overtones in his work. And so, the volume was put together with this multidisciplinary vision in mind, where there are essays by three philosophers, two legal scholars, a rhetorician, and a uh, womanist theologian. So I think the volume will go a long way toward giving us insights into facets of Bell's work, particularly racial realism, that have been underexamined uh, for the most part. I think Bell has certainly been underexamined in philosophy, and I think the theological dimensions of his work have been underexamined. And I think it is time, given the legal climate in the United States and perhaps in other places around the world, but especially in the United States, it is time to re-examine and study carefully his work as a legal scholar. And so the book puts together scholars from all of those backgrounds into what I, I hope will be a very insightful collection of essays, not about Derrick Bell broadly, because to do that in one volume would be impossible. I think his work was so far reaching, but to specifically examine his thesis of racial, racial realism which is that on one hand, uh, anti-Black racism in America is permanent, but on the other hand, we all have a moral obligation to resist it. Uh, this is the thesis that has become so controversial, uh, was controversial during his lifetime, and, and I think it a, an appropriate time to revisit that with all of the scholarly acumen that I've been fortunate enough to assemble in this volume. So that's sort of how the volume came about and how it's taken shape. 
Thanks. That's really interesting because as you were saying that, I realized that I first encountered Derek Bell when I bought Ethical Ambition, I think shortly after it had come out. I was a primary school teacher at the time and, and just picked it up in a bookshop and reading it, it was like having a sort of mentor. It was, you know, this sort of idea of ethical ambition was one that really spoke to me and it wasn't just a good title. The book itself uh, sort of helped me along. In fact, I remember gifting it to a number of colleagues as leaving presents and, and that sort of thing. In, in terms of scholarship, I came across him in, in sociology of education, even though my work's in, in philosophy of education, it, you, I just never encountered him there. It was, it was the sociologists uh, who were working on race, who, who were drawing on his, on his literature. This is in the UK, obviously. Mm -hmm. So I guess, the, I mean, you've, you've started to answer it there, but the, the obvious question to, 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 to kick us off is, what is meant by racial realism? What, what, is, what does Bell mean by it? And are you in any way sort of, changing what he's doing or, or just ensuring that they, it's understood because, you know, too few people read Bell himself? So I think you have to understand, not, not you specifically, but generally, I think people ought to understand that it, Bell begins, and the philosopher, this will resonate with the philosophers who are listening, Bell begins his thesis of racial realism by making an inductive claim. This is a claim that is fundamentally based on experience. Uh, it is a claim that is not only in, perhaps because it is inductive, it is empirical in nature. Derek Bell is fundamentally committed to a serious examination of socioeconomic data, data in healthcare, et cetera, that shows racism's uh, flourishing in, in ways that disadvantage Black people in not only legal institutions, but in socioeconomic institutions and in healthcare institutions. So Bell is, is interested in a certain empiricism, and he, he makes the claim that based on experience, uh, based on the experiences of African Americans in the United States, it is, <coughs> excuse me, that this experience shows that racism, and this is a sort of quote from him, uh, ra racism itself finds ways to adapt in ways that maintain white dominance rather than go away. Now, it, it is important to understand that Bell is working within a much broader tradition of black intellectual history in the United States. In fact, in the final revisions that he made to his magnum opus, Race, Racism, and American Law, he credits much of his insight about the permanence of racism to the work of Ralph Bunch. That's the Harvard-educated political theorist who in the 1930s diagnosed as a, criti diagnosed as a critique of African-Americans who thought that legal that the legal system would be a way to gain liberation uh, from the legacy of slavery, that that was not the case. And he argued that, uh, Ralph Bunch that is, argued that what ends up happening is that the Supreme Court, when it comes to the American Negro, he wrote in, I think it was 1935, the Supreme Court engages in such a level of abstraction that it completely ignores the concrete realities of Black life. And here, Bunch was talking about a series of cases from the court in the 1930s and 19, in the 1930s and going into the, um, that would eventually extend into the 1940s that upheld the denial of Black suffrage, not based on the concrete realities of Black life, but based on abstract legal reasoning that essentially dehistoricized and neglected the material and social conditions of Black people. So Bell is inheriting that intellectual tradition. And that, frankly, that tradition extends back further than Ralph Bunch. It goes all the way back to the, the work of, of Martin Delaney in the uh, 19th century, who was not optimistic at all about the prospect of African-Americans receiving equal treatment under law. 
And, and so Bell is, is sort of working within this much broader African-American uh, tradition of African-American social and political thought. And so that's the first part of his thesis, right? That, that racism is permanent and that specifically law, American law and legal institutions will end up vindicating racism rather than eradicating it. And I, I just wanna make this point too. Uh, I think as evidence of that, Bell would point to W.E.B. Du Bois who in his essay, The Suppression of the African Slave Trade makes it clear that the legal doctrine of federalism, which is this notion that each state has autonomy and there's a federal government that's also autonomous. Du Bois makes it clear that the legal notion of federalism was used in the Philadelphia Convention of 1787 that resulted in the drafting of the Constitution, that this concept of federalism inherited by um, the American founders from the English common law was conveniently used in the convention debates to justify a hands-off approach to chattel slavery. So in other words, the delegates from the Southern United States and the Northern United States were arguing, he points out, but eventually they just resorted to federalism. So the Northern states essentially said, well, why don't we just adhere to this legal doctrine and let the states do as they wish? And we'll take a hands-off approach. We'll let the states be autonomous. Now, this is occurring at America's founding, right? At its initial constitutional convention. And Bell is going to look at a circumstance such as that, which he does in his early work, and we are not saved, the elusive quest for racial justice, and he's going to say, this is the problem. This is the reason why racism is permanent because the legal doctrine of federalism upon which courts have relied time and again, even into the 21st century when it comes to voting rights for African-Americans, that because of this legal doctrine, states will be able to do as they please. And that has never been good for black people. So the first part of the thesis is that racism is permanent. Uh, and then the second part of the thesis is that despite its permanence, we still have a moral obligation to fight against it. Uh, this is what really left a lot of people scratching their heads. And Derek Bell in one interview, he likened this approach to that of an alcoholic who is trying to recover and become sober. The alcoholic, Bell points out, will always have to say, I will always be an alcoholic. Because if they don't say that, then they're likely to relapse. So it's almost as though we have to say America will always be racist, right? And in making that claim, we are in some sense, uh, channeling a spirit, right? A, a, a spirit of resistance that comes to us from a variety of, of actors in black history who are well known like Thurgood Marshall with whom Bell litigated cases in the 1950s before, 50s and early 60s before uh, President Kennedy appointed Thurgood Marshall to the Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit in New York. And one person who Derek Bell points to in one of his landmark essays where he explains racial realism named Biona McDonald, who was a, a poor black woman from Mississippi. And Derek Bell asked her in 1964, where do you get your, where do you get your energy to continue to resist? And her reply to Derek Bell was, Derek, I lives to harass white folks, right? And what she meant by that and what Bell meant by using her example was that she embodied a spirit of resistance to racism against overwhelming odds. And this sense of resistance 
is where the victory lies. We are defeat, racism has won the battle the day that we decide to give up the struggle against it. And this is Bell's point in citing to the life of Mrs. Beona McDonald in Mississippi. So we have these two claims that appear to be at odds with one another. How do you resist the inevitable? How do you fight against what appears to be in, uh, unable to be overcome? And, and I think that's what Bell is, is getting at when he talks about racial realism. I mean, that, that's such a helpful answer. And uh, also such a comprehensive one that you've, you've managed to touch on so many of my questions. I'm not sure where to go now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay in the order I had it. And, and if you feel like, oh, we've covered that, feel free sure. to say. I, I, I wanted to read out a quote for people who weren't familiar with, with Bell's work from his, I think it's his paper, Racial Realism, uh, and, and some of the sentiments you've already covered. But he says, black people will never gain full equality in this country. Even those Herculean efforts we hail as successful will produce no more than temporary peaks of progress, short-lived victories that slide into irrelevance as racial patterns adapt in ways that maintain white dominance. And he, he goes on to say, we must acknowledge it and move on to adopt policies based on what I call racial realism. This mindset of philosophy requires us to acknowledge the permanence of our subordinate status. That acknowledgement enables us to avoid despair and free us to imagine and implement racial strategies that can bring fulfillment and even triumph. And as, as I read that, I, I have genuine questions that come to mind. The first being, how does this view enable us to avoid despair? So I think the view enables us uh, to avoid despair. And I sort of want to go back to what I said about Derek Bell and the alcoholic. Right. This was this was a persistent question. The question you just raised was a persistent question that Bell received during his life. And and the one way that he answered it that I think is is very effective. And I, I have another that I'll share with you in a moment. Uh, but the one way that he did it that I think was very effective was to talk about the alcoholic. Right. If if we believe that racism is a temporary phenomenon or a phenomenon that can be overcome somehow, I think that frankly, we, we're rushed in that way, we are sort of rushed to coming up with theory and with solutions to help solve a problem that many of us have failed to engage, certainly the many whites have failed to engage. Because to engage racism in all of its uh, in all of its uh, complexity is for whites, uh, certainly in the United States, to come to grips with the role that they have played in maintaining white supremacy. And most people, most whites, I don't think, are prepared for that intense level of self-examination. Uh, mm -hmm. So Bell demands something from us, and to uh, to to say that racism is is temporary, in in a sense, is really just a way to avoid responsibility. Because if we can say, "Oh, one day it's going to all be over," then we can just keep kicking the can down the road. Whereas if we embrace it and we say, "Yes, it is permanent." then much like the alcoholic, we have to remain vigilant against it. We, we have to, uh, we cannot rest. Uh, here, I'm, I hear echoes in the background of the French philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, who often speaks of a condition that he calls insomnia, an inability to rest, a complete disruption of one's economy of enjoyment an economy of enjoyment, frankly, that most whites have become so accustomed to that the thought of sacrificing that for the greater good of living in a, in a world uh, that, or of attempting to live in a world that is not as um, racist as, as it is now is just too much. Uh, there's just too much there. So I think that's how, well, one way that we avoid despair, but the other way that I'd like to touch on now 
And this sort of comes from the introduction to the volume, which I understand you've read and you're familiar with the introduction. Uh, I've titled the introduction to the book, I Want My Ham. And this of course is taken from the great African-American playwright, August Wilson, who wrote a play called Two Trains Running. And in that play, there is a character named Hambone. Uh, Hambone was promised a ham if he painted a fence for a white butcher shop owner as part of the story. And in his, uh, in his diligence, Hambone painted the fence. And when he demanded his ham after he fulfilled his end of the bargain, the butcher shop owner said, I'm going to offer you a chicken instead. Uh, Hambone, for anyone who has seen two trains running live in theaters, has a mental disability, and he can only say two things. The character has two lines in the entire play. I want my ham. He going to give me my ham. That's all he says. Now, I was fortunate enough because outside of the academy, I do some acting and I played Hambone in a production of Two Trains Running about three years ago in Portland, Oregon. And to embody that character, a character who August Wilson wrote into that script in some sense to embody the entirety of the African-American experience, which is to be on the receiving end of a broken promise, to be promised, to be promised the ham of freedom but to be given the chicken of despair, so to speak. And uh, Hambone becomes a hero in the story because although he dies without ever getting his ham, it's clear from the discussion of the other characters in the story that Hambone's courage and his persistence in demanding his ham every day, although he was unsuccessful, is where Hambone's real heroism lies. So I would hope that people would see the heroism of Hambone. And in fact, I call for in, as you know, in the introduction, I call for a Hambone-like commitment in the struggle for freedom in America as Derek Bell did, because like Bell, I, I tend to agree that the day we see struggle is the day we lose the battle. Hambone never stopped struggling and neither should we. Yeah, and I was, I was, I was moved reading that about Hambone, and, and you made the link with uh, Mrs. Bayona MacDonald, who you mentioned, mm -hmm. and, and Bell's idea that it is in, it's in the struggle that we, or that black people, because uh, I think he's, he's addressing black people in, in the main, gain meaning in life. I, I guess that the question that could be put is, where is the, is there capacity for joy? in that, that there doesn't seem to be in, in the Hambone story, it seems to be that resistance gives meaning, but presumably that existence is also defined exclusively by resistance. And I just wonder how that's dealt with in a, in a sort of personal way of, of living life and knowing of, you know, activist burnout, for example, how, how joy can factor in that. Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure, well, I think uh, for me, I can speak for me personally, I, I am an academic, um, an academic philosopher outside of academic philosophy. I have uh, artistic interests in theater. So I do acting, I do perform. And of course, I also have my work as a lawyer. And in the midst of all of that, uh, I think people still have basic things that we all take joy in, friends, family, and so what I do, uh, for example, is I cherish those moments with my family, with my friends. We're in the holiday season now, Thanksgiving, et cetera. The work of resistance is exhausting. Uh, I try to have connections with other people who are similarly engaged in this work. Uh, I have been very fortunate to uh, get to know some fine scholars who are engaged in this work of resistance, such as Dr. Tommy J. Curry. And I, I have been able to uh, forge a, a personal connections and, and friendships with people along the way. 
And so I think resistance need not necessarily mean resistance exclusively, but I think it can mean resistance as a priority amidst the other virtues and joys that characterize human life, right? So we can still be engaged in, in the struggle and yet find room for, for joy and to experience the, the joy of friends, family, and small things in everyday life. So resistance is not, uh, although it is a priority, it is not exclusive. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I wanna ask about uh, the, uh, Derek Bell's notion of interest convergence. Um, and you discuss in, in your introduction how the election of Barack Obama was an example of interest convergence. And you say there was a moment where with the, the financial crisis, the financial interests of upper class and middle class whites coincidentally converged with the hopes and dreams of African Americans, hopes and dreams that were long standing because they were long deferred. Um, echoing uh, Langston Hughes. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess the, 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 I want to ask sincerely uh, is is in, in the simplest terms, what's the problem with interest convergence to, can it be seen because it's often i think presented as oh you thought that was progress actually it was interest convergence but can it be seen as as good diplomacy even as good activist strategy to find a way of framing a gain to oneself or one's own group as helpful to those with whom you are negotiating or is that necessarily limiting the, the possibility of change? So, so I think in, in a democracy uh, like the United States, and when it comes to public policy, um, because of public policy, the way it's formed, the compromises involved, there will always be some level of interest convergence, right? And I don't think that interest convergence, generally speaking, is necessarily a bad thing. But that is not the sort of thing that Derek Bell is talking about. Right? Derek Bell is talking about a very specific phenomenon in which uh, whites tend to set the agenda in the United States. And as long as if, if if the hopes and dreams of black people happen, just happen to coincide with what white people are interested in addressing in that historical moment, then we get what we call pro racial progress. But the moment that it is no longer a priority for whites, whites can cease their uh, putting their efforts behind this uh, sort of initiative. So for example, consider the, the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States, right? Now, last year, uh, beginning with, I should say, beginning with Colin Kaepernick and sort of ending with George Floyd, there was a, a flurry and a firestorm of activism and hope and so forth and so on in the United States. And last year, the National Football League the American football uh, professional league of franchises, not to be confused with football in the UK or in other parts of the world, which here we call soccer. Uh, they came together and they decided that uh, they settled the lawsuit with Colin Kaepernick and legal settlement settlements are often thoroughly immoral, right? Because you end up with one of the entities uh, signing off a sum of money and indicating in the settlement agreement that they did no wrongdoing, right? Yeah. So, so you have a settlement against Colin Kaepernick. And then in the wake of the George Floyd murder last year, you have a flurry of activity and people are, are up in arms and calling for reform and so forth. And so the National Football League decides that what they're going to do is they're going to allow words and phrases like and racism to be put on player uniforms. All the while, the National Football League is practicing 
something called race norming. And race norming is a process whereby the National Football League's concussion protocol uh, program in which retired players who have experienced cognitive decline that they can show have been caused by excessive head injury or concussions are entitled to receive compensation from the league. Well, it turns out that a group of black players was asking for compensation and they were routinely being denied while white players were routinely having their claims paid. And as it turns out, it was discovered through litigation just in June of this year, or I guess before June of this year, but sometime in 2021, it was discovered through litigation that the reason the black players claims were being denied is because their cognitive starting point was considered to be lower than that of whites. And if your cognitive starting point is lower, it's more difficult for you to prove cognitive decline. Essentially, the National Football League, even as they talked about ending racism, had been practicing for decades this, this theory of race norming, which assumes in very racist fashion that white players are not as smart as black players. So, so we, can, we can look at the surface, right? And we can talk about uh, the wealthy corporate interests of National Football League ownership just so happening to converge with the interests of black people. And they sort of caved under pressure. And I thought of how hypocritical it was then to have statements like and racism put on player helmets and emblazoned in the end zone on the field when you are in the process of practicing racism towards your black players. So yes, Darren, I think in some sense, there will always be an overlap of interests in public policy, but Derek Bell was after a very specific kind of almost devious sort of interest convergence when it comes to African-Americans that, end up just being mere racial symbols and that end up not being progress at all. We could take other examples such as the President Biden's declaration about Juneteenth, right? He declares mm. Juneteenth a federal holiday and African-Americans are pleased with that and are happy with that. But that's nothing but a racial symbol. Why? Because meanwhile, African-Americans still don't have comprehensive legislation on police reform. And there's still the right to vote, which has only been protected for 48 years in American history, is still vulnerable. Uh, in the same way that in 1986, when Ronald Reagan signed the Martin Luther King holiday into law, he was at the same time espousing crippling criminal justice policies that have resulted in the phenomenon that Michelle Alexander has referred to as mass incarceration. So uh, would you rather have a federal holiday or would you rather have uh, legal protection? And I think this is the kind of thing that Bell is, is talking about. So I think that's a little different from yeah, yeah. the sort of inherent convergence of interests that occurs in public policy. Bell's targeting a very specific kind of approach that whites use to placate blacks in the United States when it comes to uh, when it comes to the, the idea of racial progress. That, that's really helpful, Tim. And, and, and as you were speaking, I, I heard about the, uh, the American football case, but also a bunch of examples of, of sport in the UK came to mind and which many people watching probably are aware of or can find out. I, I, I've got time for one last question. So sure. it's a sort of follow up on this interest convergence one. And it, it takes me back to the, the inscription at the, at the the front of faces at the bottom of the well, um, where where Derek Bell writes about um, only by working together is escape possible. He's talking about the poorest whites looking down into the well at black people. Uh, over time, many reach out, but most simply watch mesmerized. And and I want to ask about why attempts to 
for black and white working class interests to converge have 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 been so unsuccessful in the USA. And I'm not saying only the USA, but why is it that working class white America is satisfied with what Du Bois termed the psychological wages of whiteness rather than fair wages for working class people? I think because what you've seen from uh, in American history is something similar to what you see today, for example. So in the wake of slavery, uh, there was an attempt to unify the interests of poor whites and the interests of poor blacks, but wealthy slave owners convinced poor whites that, to use Du Bois's term, the psychological wages of whiteness were worth more than any allegiance that they could ever hope to have with black people. And I think that has become sort of a playbook, so to speak. And President Trump played that card well. Here you have a, a wealthy white person who has convinced many poor whites with whom he has very little in common that any sort of solidarity or allegiance with black people is, is somehow evil. And you have poor whites calling for the end of critical race theory here in the United States, right? You have, and, and the fact of the matter is, and this, this is important too, it is, it is so important for us to sort of understand exactly what critical race theory is. And, and I don't think we have a good handle on that, but nevertheless, I think wealthy whites have taken a page out of the, the post reconstruction playbook and, and I think you see it replayed with a terrifying accuracy today uh, in a world in which there are poor whites in America who are woefully loyal to President Trump and would, would rather uh, accept, as Du Bois says, again, to quote him again, the psychological wages of whiteness uh, rather than any sort of alliance with African Americans. So, I think it is, and it's a way for wealthy whites to sort of maintain control, right? They can maintain social control, economic control, if they can keep blacks and whites apart. And, and now that racism has gotten so deep that you have poor whites who wouldn't imagine ever having any sort of alliance uh, with black people. And racism has, has won out again, and, and it's played out socially um, in, in our social relationships and politically in, certainly in, in law, in, in American law and in the American legal system. Thank you. Now I've got a few questions on the q and I'm gonna try and select questions that speak directly to what we've been discussing and, and to, to Derek Bell. Um, do you think that Derek Bell's philosophy of racial realism can be conceptualized or framed as an existentialist philosophy? This person says, I'm thinking here of the fact that it seems like for Bell, we gain deep meaning and a sort of authentic living, not from defeating racism, but from the struggle against it, much like Sisyphus, which I yes. believe is on the cover of your book. Or yes, at least the, that's, exactly, that's exactly right. Sisyphus is on the cover of the book. And my next book project is an extension of Bell, uh, reading Bell with the existentialist tradition. Bell himself uh, talks about the existentialist tradition in early on in Faces at the Bottom of the Well. He has a brief commentary on Camus and the need to die resisting, so to speak. So yes, I think there is some continuity there, but I also think that as scholars like Dr. Tommy Curry have pointed out, it is in very important never to lose sight of the fact that whatever connections we may make with Bell and other philosophical traditions, connections that I myself intend to make in my next book on Bell with Bell and existentialism, we must never lose sight of the fact that Bell's inheritance and his motivation is a tradition of African-American social and political thought that really begins in the 19th century. I, I, one of the things I find so fascinating about Curry's work is that uh, Curry is committed to the notion of developing a, a distinctly, uh, when Curry speaks of African-American philosophy, 
he's speaking about African-American philosophy as done by African-Americans, right? And uh, it may be the case that there are connections between Bell and European thinkers, but I think Curry reminds us, and rightly so, that there is a tradition of Black thought and Black intellectual history in the United States that ought not be occluded because we see echoes of Bell or a resonance of Bell with white European thinkers. Uh, so I think, I think that's important to keep in mind. Thank you. Another question here, what is the relationship between racial realism and Afro-pessimism? Interesting, that's interesting. Frank Wilderson's book, I think is uh, very compelling in this way. Uh, he talks about the status of black people as slaves uh, permanently. And I, I think there, it seems to me that there is a, uh, is a pretty robust connection, uh, certainly between the claims that are made in, in both Bell and Wilderson. I would have to read Wilderson a little bit more to say anything definitive, but I think on the surface, there is a, a certain resonance there that seems quite strong. Thank you. How, how if, if at all, could the racial realism uh, be disproved? Or to put it differently, what would be the key measures by which we may ascertain if we've moved closer to overcoming racial, the racial realism thesis? Would it mainly be economic measures? Uh, I don't think it would be, I don't think it would be mainly economic because I think the tentacles of American racism are run so deep. So I think you have to look at economics, you have to look at healthcare, you have to look at law, specifically the administration of criminal justice, you'd have to look at education, you'd have to look at voting rights. So I think there, I, I don't think in any one area, you, would you be able to look at one area and say, oh, we've seen real progress here. Uh, I think with any inductive claim, the about even especially Bell's claim about the permanence of racism, um, inductive claims are, they tend to sort of just abide with us, right? I mean, I think, I think Bell's claim, I mean, until they're disproved, and, and I guess theoretically, if you saw uh, substantial improvement in all of those areas uh, that I just mentioned, then maybe you could say that, but even then you'd have to ask what was the motivation for the so-called improvement because you'd have to grapple with interest convergence, et cetera. So I think the answer to that question is, is as complex as the problem itself. Uh, I'm not so sure you're gonna get to a point where you see a, a policy that is not infected with interest convergence and that shows real racial progress in all of those areas. So I, I don't think that sort of uh, sort of uh, refutation is, is forthcoming. But you, you sort of sketched out some of the indicators for people who would be interested. And I guess this question is, is, is connected and, and, and probably a question you're quite familiar with or on similar is haven't the social political positions of African-Americans greatly improved since the founding of the Republic? No, <laughs> I, I, I don't think so. So there is, there is improvement with, uh, if you want to say that, you know, chattel slavery has come to an end and, and that we, the world is, is sort of different now. I mean, yes, there, there have been, um, there have been changes to American law that have prevented conditions like slavery, but there have not been corresponding changes to the hearts and minds of people. So for example, you can have a situation with George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin that socially, uh, parallels the situation between an escaped slave named Demby and an overseer named Mr. Gore, who Frederick Douglass refers to in his autobiographical narrative. The only two, the only difference between those two situations is 
time and circumstance. So the, the, the time change, obviously this is Douglas is writing his narrative in 1845. And the story is that there was a slave named Denby who had grown weary of being whipped and went into a pond to cool his wounds. And the overseer, Mr. Gore, who was the site of law and authority on the plantation demanded that he come out of the out of the pond and Denby said no and Mr. Gore shot him. In fact, Frederick Douglass uses the phrase Denby stood his ground. Standing one's ground became part of our legal culture and popular culture during the Trayvon Martin incident where a person uh, made a demand on an African-American and uh, that African-American resisted and ended up dead. So we can talk about the fact that slavery is no more, but there is an epistemic and uh, there's an epistemic form of domination that has not changed. And this epistemic form of domination puts whites at the center of authority and, and law and puts blacks outside of law and authority as subjects to be socially controlled. And that's what we saw happen with, uh, with Trayvon Martin. And we've seen that happen again so much, um, particularly with the recent conviction of the three white men who killed Ahmed Arbery. These are whites who operate within a framework of epistemic domination that is unique, perhaps unique to the United States that in such that they feel deputized and justified killing a black person who refuses to accede to their demands. Uh, so I, I say with some, with some force here, some emphasis that the letter of the law may have changed, but the spirit of the people, the form of epi epistemic domination um, has not changed. And, and, and I think connected to that is, is the refusal to give up unjust power for, for Bell and, and for you, is it a problem of, of whiteness, of white supremacy, or is it a problem of the human condition? I think for Bell, it is a problem of whiteness. It may be the case that it is also a problem of the human condition, uh, but I think Bell is much more interested in, would be much more interested in, in the social phenomenon of how whiteness, uh, whiteness prevents uh, Black people, or prevents uh, racial equality in the United States. Um, oh, I just saw, sorry, uh, someone says fantastic discussion. That's very nice to hear. Uh, given what's been said about black thought in the US, uh, I'd be interested to know how easily Professor Golden thinks Bell's analysis can be applied in other national contexts like the UK, for example. Can the theory be detached from the immediate material reality that Bell was responding to? And I guess I'd add, if not, you know, what, what can be done? So, so I think uh, if there are similar histories in other countries to, the, to, the, to that of the United States, I think Bell's analysis would indeed be uh, transcendent in that way, that it would affect what happens in, that it could be used as a framework to analyze uh, racism in other countries. Of course, I'm not familiar, I'm not as familiar with the histories of other countries as, as I am with the history of the United States, but I think any nation that was forged with slavery or with any dehumanization as a predicate for its existence would indeed be subject to the sort of analysis that Bell is giving us. But I, I would like to say that my interest in, in Bell's work uh, at, is, is really stems from me being an African-American. And as an African-American, I inhabit a world of Black people who are unique in a sense, because unlike many of my African friends or Afro-Caribbean friends, 
I, I don't have a place to go outside of the United States. Genetic companies like 23andMe notwithstanding, right? I may be able to find out in some strange sort of way what part of Africa uh, I'm from and so forth and so on. But that does nothing to change the fact that my home is in the United States. I'm from Philadelphia. So I, when, it, when I talk of going home, I talk like many other African-Americans do of going to another American city. I have African friends or Caribbean friends that can go to African countries and Caribbean countries and other places around the world where they have a language, where they have, they can speak another language, they have a culture, uh, et cetera, that is uniquely theirs in ways that that is not the case for someone like me. So I, I, I think it is, and this was part of the motivation for the book, it is terribly important to preserve a unique form of African American thought because African Americans have a culture that is unique to them. And, and this is not to say that uh, African Americans should close themselves off and not interact with other cultures, but it's just to say that there needs to be a deep appreciation for African American thought and African American life. And I think that this volume goes a long way toward trying to uh, develop that sense of appreciation and preserve it. I'm just gonna sneak in one final question. Thank you for, for answering those so carefully. Um, this is, yeah, this is one was asked quite a while ago, so apologies to the questioner. In Derek Bell's piece, Racial Ra Realism, he makes an analogical argument Racial realism is to race relations as legal realism is to jurisprudential thought. Can you break down Bell's argument here? So the legal historical background between legal realism and formalism and how this relates to racial realism and race relations. That's really important. Absolutely, yeah. So in legal, uh, in jurisprudence or, or what we call philosophy of law, there are two theories, two principal theories of adjudication. One is legal formalism. According to formalism, law exists independent of human beings. It has a certain a priori quality to it. And the way that law is taught, at least in American universities and law schools, is that when what, what happens when a judge makes a decision is that the law is applied to a set of facts to reach a conclusion. That's the traditional way that lawyers are trained in the United States. Another theory of adjudication that resists that or that sort of rejects the a priori nature of law is American legal realism. Not surprisingly, American legal realism was not the result of academic or intellectual thought, but the result of lawyers who were actually practicing law. And the thesis of American legal realism is that when a judge decides a case, a, judges, a judge is responding fundamentally to the stimulus of the facts of a case. So it's the facts of the case that cause the judge to make a decision. And then the judge looks to the law as a sort of post hoc justification and ultimately ends up saying, well, now that I've made this decision based on the facts, I can find almost any justification for my decision in the law right? Because there's more than one way to decide a case. So you have that and in, in philosophy of law or in jurisprudential thought. What Bell is saying is that racial realism arises out of the American uh, legal realist tradition because it takes race seriously as a motivating factor in adjudication, such that when a judge decides a case, the judge is probably is not motivated by some a priori notion of law floating around out there somewhere, but there's something about the facts of the case that lead the judge to decide the way he or she decides it if it's if it's a case involving race and racial dynamics. So mm -hmm. there's a there's a little more to it uh, there, but I think that would be the gist of his comparison.
And what he tries to show, and one of my essays in the book uh, talks about racial realism and American legal realism, is that uh, is that when it comes to courts deciding cases in the United States, you've had formalism, which has been used to give abstract interpretations of the Constitution that are harmful to Black people. So in 1973, you had a white man named Alan Bakke who sued the University of California for its race conscious admissions policy and applying an abstract notion of legal formalism, the court took the term equality to mean that you could not be race, racially conscious even if it was an attempt to remedy past discrimination. And this is the kind of danger that Bell thinks ends up happening in jurisprudence when formalism takes center stage and Bell thinks that a realist account of the Bakke decision would have taken into consideration the uh, social, socioeconomic and material conditions of black people and would have said, this is a race conscious policy, but it's a benign sort of discrimination. And so the affirmative action program would have remained in place. But instead, what we get is an almost laughable notion of reverse racism why? Because of the problem of abstract formalism. So I think that's what Bell's getting at there. 